and welcome from UC Berkeley Art Museum and Pacific Film Archive. My name is Julia White. I'm Senior Curator for Asian Art here at the Berkeley Art Museum. And it's my pleasure to welcome you members of the Asia Art Society of Hong Kong to a virtual tour by my co-curator, Osman Bokarachi. Osman is a very well-known and distinguished scholar of Buddhist art, particularly uh, focusing on the area of Gandharan art. He and I co-curated this exhibition, which will run until March 13th here in Berkeley. Uh, the exhibition was organized around a seminar that Osmond developed for UC Berkeley graduate students on the art of Gandhara, which he taught virtually from Paris, France in uh, 2020. From that uh, initial idea of uh, a, a graduate student seminar, we developed this exhibition that, will fo that focuses on, uh, specifically on the art of Gandhara. We include works from uh, private collections as well as from public collections, and we're very pleased to say that it has been quite well received here in Berkeley. So I'm sorry that um, the members of the Asia Society, Asia Society of Hong Kong are not able to see the exhibition in person, but I'm sure you'll enjoy Osman's wonderful presentation, which um, uh, lasts about 45 minutes. So thank you, and uh, I hope that at some point you'll be able to visit us here in Berkeley. So you all know I'm in Gandhari situated. It's here, south of the Hindu Kush Mountains, uh, uh, slopes. Uh, one of the things that we really wanted to insist upon was the conquest of Alexander the Great, uh, conquering the world. <coughs> He came to Ghana and also the other regions uh, around between 327 and 26. Uh, and uh, he conquered Bati thought the, the whole world. Right? So, according to, I mean, during that period, the world, the world was limited to this part only, including Europe. And the rest was, was known. So, we will start with that. between Alexander the Great and Porus, which was the prince, right, who came with these elephants. Uh, this is a fake news, in a way, because Alexander never encountered uh, Porus uh, in a duel. So during the attack, he fell down from his elephant, and then he became a prisoner. Uh, but the, uh, the, the uh, mean engraver wanted to show it off, saying that Alexander, Alexander had a real fight. Right? But after the, so just to show that, uh, so, uh, so just to show that he conquered the India and also the Indus. So Alexander is shown like Zeus, the supreme god of the Greek Pontion, holding a thunderbolt in the hand. So after him, uh, there were many Greek kings ruling in the region. Um, uh, but here we have a coin of Diatotus, who was a satrap. He was under the Seleucid Empire, but he revolted against and then became an independent ruler, we call it the Greek Macrae Kingdom. So he has his own portrait, and on the reverse, he claims that he is, I mean, legend is Basilios Diodotu, means of the king, Diodotus. So all the points, it's in genitive case, saying that this is the property of the king. And after that, uh, he was succeeded by he was I'm not going to show you all the 45, 45 <laughs> kings, just, uh, just to give you an idea. So all this time, these kings were in the north, as you can see. So since he's from a different dynasty, he has Heracles. Uh, Diodotus has had Zeus because Diodotus means the gift of God, referring to Zeus. And here we have Heracles because he came from the region of Anatolia, where Heracles was. As you know, I mean, I'm sorry if I tell you things that you already know, but I consider it that I have to say everything. Heracles was a mortal who became an immortal. He was accepted in the Pontium. So here, here we have Heracles. And then Demetrius, by this time when Demetrius came to power, the power of this, uh, the, the, uh, the Indian kingdom, the Mauryan Empire, was declining. So he crossed the Indian Mountains and came to India. 
Then they came to India, until then you have seen they have only meeting points with the Greek legend, they are monolingual. When they crossed the Hindu-Bush mountains, they came into the Indian region, in Kandahar. So they didn't, the Indians didn't know Greek. So what they did was, they first met the legend, Basileos Soteros Menandru, that means of the king Menander, the savior. The same legend is translated into Gandhari, which is an earlier form of the simplified Sanskrit. You read it from right to left, Maharajasa, Tatrasa, Menandrasa. So it is a sad translation of the Greek legend. So there are going to be many things. What is important after that is that um, uh, after the Greeks, the Scythians came to power. Uh, instead of showing the, uh, the, the, the portrait of the king, Scythians, what they did was they, they, um, they invented something absolutely wonderful. That they minted these coins with the king on the horseback. And the horse, uh, the, the king is wearing what we call cataphractors which is heavy armor, like the knights of the medieval period. And they continued the tradition. And after that, after uh, uh, Asis, the Kushans came, it is under the Kushan Empire, the Gandharan Buddhist map was born. So we have Kujira Katfisis, Vimataktu, Vima Katfisis, we have all the coins here. And then Kanishka, um, with the, the first issues of the, the on the rivers, you have Buddha, and it is written Buddha. Mm -hmm. And uh, so, uh, this is the first time that we see Buddha in anthropomorphic form, that means in human, in human figure. So, all the other uh, previous art forms, he was symbolized by a throne, by a Bodhi tree, or by uh, by other symbols, the Buddha Pada, the big tree. So, so this is the beginning of the art, right? Now to explain, I mean until now I took some time to explain the history. So we go to the first sculpture. To uh, why it is important? For many reasons. In the ancient world, all the sculptures were painted. Whether in Egypt, Greece, Rome, India, China or Japan. So the polychrome is gone, but we are very lucky to have this sculpture still with the traces of the paint, paintings. What happens is normally, I mean, this was a misunderstanding of the 15th century during the 15th, 16th century during the time of Michelangelo and Da Vinci. When they, uh, when they recovered the ancient sculptures, the marble appeared as white. So those days they didn't know over the marble, there was a there was a plaster and they were all painted. So th that's the reason why Michelangelo started, um, you have seen David, um, David and also Pieta, which is in Vatican, they all became white. So only recent years that Smithsonian and other, I mean German uh, laboratories, they started studying the pigments of the Greek art. So you have to bear in mind, what we see here, there's something missing, that is the painting. So this is the reason why in my, um, in my PowerPoints I always color the sculptures to give you an idea. So that's the first thing that we have to uh, bear in mind. And why this is important. So here you have a pagan, uh, you know, it has a base and it has a bell-shaped uh, capital downward. And then on the top of it, the capital has two back-to-back -back bulls, what we call the zebu, the bulls with the hump. Right? So this is what you call the Persepolitan columns. So here we have a Corinthian column uh, imitating the Acanthus leaves. I don't know whether when you come to Berkeley you can see Acanthus plant. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so those are the, uh, this is the imitation. So you can see the Greek and the Persian. Here of course you have a Buddha uh, uh, preaching and there are Bodhisattvas also seated. Um, after that, you can come and have a closer, closer look of this, right? And the people venerating on either side, right? And he is sorted, I mean, seated on a lotus base, and you can see with the weight of the body of the Buddha, the lotus is really in a curved shape. And two elephants holding each uh, uh, lotus flower is under the throne. 
I wanted to draw your attention, so I, I was speaking to you about the Greek inspiration. This is, of course, Indian story, but the motives are Greek and Persian. Right in the middle, you have a couple. So you have what we call Hariti and Panchika. So that's Hariti. I'll, I'll go to that in a moment. Right? That sculpture, which is a fabulous sculpture. Um, in Iranian, it's called, I mean, it's called Ardokshu because we know the name from the coins, because on the coins it's named Ardokshu. And in the Indian context, it's called Hariti. Hariti was a, a, a demoniac spirit who had a thousand children. And to feed their children, she used to kill the other children of the village and give blood. So, uh, I'm, I'm making a long story short. <laughs> and, the, and the people of the village went to the Buddha and said, you know, this is what is happening to our young children. So what Buddha did was, took the youngest of Hariti and hid the kid in his ball. Hariti was so upset, he went all over the world looking for the missing child. And then came to the Buddha and Buddha said, gave the child and said, you have thousand children and you were weeping for just one. How about others who had just one, one child? So he became some sort of a mother goddess. So the goddess of pregnancy, goddess of protection. So there are many sculptures, you can see Hariti with, um, uh, uh, with children playing. And then they became with uh, Panchika, who is the god of fortune. And also you can see she is holding what we call a cornucopia, horn of abundance. So that's the, uh, the Indian version of Taiki, or the city goddess, or the Fortuna, that you see in Rome and, and Greece. So you can see the, the Greek element taking form in the uh, Indian world. Other important characters, so we are going to see another sculpture in a while, we have four atlas. Now in the Greek mythology, they were not gods, they were titans, right? And uh, they were supposed to hold the, the universe, not the world. I mean, for the Greeks that time, the world was flat. So they, they, um, so they hold the universe. Here, they are holding the earth, right? So they are holding the building um, uh, where Buddha is seated. So that's again Greek. Uh, you may not see because you are too far, but after that you can have a look. You have a couple on either side. The man is normally old, the woman is young, and they are drinking. <laughs> and <laughs> there are some scenes where they are flirting and they are I mean, kissing and drinking and all that. So this is what we call the Dionysian scenes. Or oh, in an uh, Indian context, uh, these were Gandharvas and to show the pleasures of worldly life. So if you take everything together, this is, this is, I mean, there are two pieces for me. These are the masterpieces and we are very fortunate to see these. Uh, on the headdress, here you have a tower of the city, right? So in my, even there you have the tower of the city and she is half Greek, half Indian. Why she is Greek? Because the, the kitchen, uh, the dress that she is wearing, diaphanous, transparent. But you have Greek elements here, some sort of a money maker with the bow uh, leaf, the body, the big, uh, the picus religiosa, which became you know, under, the, under the history, the Buddha uh, was illuminated or enlightened. So you have many, and also the jewellery, right? This part is Greek, this is Greek, and the Halloween is Indian, the, the earrings are Indian, and the dog is Persian, you know, the tight necklace that normally you find. And then the long, uh, long um, uh, necklace, uh, I mean, coming between the breasts, uh, which is a common feature in, uh, in Indian art. So you can see the, uh, I always insist when I, uh, when I talk about it, the Greek inspiration, this is not to relate a Greek story. This is to relate an Indian story. But they take the Greek elements. So you will see everywhere in these sculptures, which you don't see um, in the Andhra Pradesh or uh, Mathura to a certain extent, but here it's very clear. So from here, I'm sorry for taking you away. Atlas, 
the, the titan who was holding the universe, but here is, there is no, uh, no universe, and he has got the wings. In the Greek legend, Atlas never had wings. Only Nike, the, the goddess of victory, had, uh, uh, had the wings, and he looks like with the wreath, uh, either ivy or grape leaves. So he um, uh, he's almost like Heracles. It's a combination of three gods. For the artists or sculptors who made these sculptures, they borrowed many elements coming from everywhere and made it something unique. Now this you will never find in Greece or in Rome. Right, it's, uh, I mean, they were not allowed to do that because there is, I mean, what we call the codified, uh, codified iconography, you can't go beyond the codification. So here is a wonderful invention and then look at this portrait. If it was found in Greece, you would say this is a portrait of Heracles, the, the way that he is portrayed. Right? And then the next to that, you have a, um, uh, I mean, it's burnt, but it's a beautiful face, beautiful image of a donor holding flowers in the hand. The, in the, it's a sarcophagi, sarcophagus. Uh, the Carlin Bearers, which is a Greek and Roman motif, but this was this is found in in Kandara. So these are Buddhists or Irotos or, Irot, uh, or Cupids uh, carrying the garlands. So these are only decorative elements of a stupa or a religious monument. And if you come here, you'll be surprised to see they are all dressed in Greek clothes, right? But what they are doing is they are dancing, they are making their music. One is playing a flute, and the middle uh, the lady is dancing, and then here again. So something is, should have happened here. This place is not found. So they are all looking with uh, what you call the Anjali Udra, which is Namaskar Buddha or the veneration. So it should be the Buddha descending or a Bodhisattva. They are all looking at it. At it. So it's a scene of a rejoice rather. So it shows, in a way, it is not Dionysian. And also the, the leaves, the great leaves here. And this also, these are all great motifs. And this is a wonderful piece, which is I mean, exhibited for the first time. These two pieces, along with another one. And I'll show it to you in a moment. If you look at it, it is a base, a pedestal of a bigger statue. So you can see the tenants here. So there should have been a statue of a Buddha like that, seated. And beneath it, you have the base with the lion's leg and the lion's paws. And in the middle, you have four figures. One is playing the harp, other one is playing the flute. And the two beautiful girls dancing, one turning the back to us, and other one facing us. So it gives you an idea of the gestures, almost like a Bollywood movie. Um, <laughs> uh, so the, these are one of the earliest, <laughs> earliest depictions of Indian, da Indian dance, um, Indian type. But it's, it's half, it's almost Greek. So The Indian schools of art, for example, Mathura, the, those sculptures are made of sandstone, red sandstone. And in Andhra Pradesh, what they call the Andhra marble, I mean, it's not the marble state, but it's hard limestone. You can work in, in depth. But these are what we call schist. It's almost like slates. So it can go into pieces. So they can't go very deep in their reliefs. So this is a very deep relief. Cut. It's very difficult to make. Um, so first of all, I'm uh, explaining to you what is happening. So here you have a Persepolitan column with the base and also back-to-back -back animals. And then on, on either side, uh, and here uh, you all can see, I hope, there are two gods, again with Tantavi Mudra, venerating Brahma here, that is in the Hindu mythology, the creator, and Indra on the other side, uh, the, the god, the supreme god, god of the gods, the gods of thunder and lightning. The reason why they are venerating the Buddha is to show that the Buddha is about the gods, about it. So we need to bear it in mind 
Buddha was born, it depends on the, um, the dating system. It could be 6th century BC or 5th century, century BC. Um, he, he was from a Buddhist background, um, Hindu background, that time there were. Um, so what he did was, he's not from the supreme caste, which you call the Brahmins, but he's from the Kshatriya caste. So here, really, the, they insisted that Buddha is above these Hindu gods. So they are always in veneration. And I think the interesting thing of this culture is the there are three registers showing three different things. So that would give us an introduction to the all the statues of the Buddha here. Here we have a Bodhisattva. Bodhisattva is a, a person who will become the Buddha, but he will stay to help the human beings. But this Bodhisattva is Siddhartha. That means before he became the Buddha, before he was enlightened. So he is here with Tabe Mudra, the gesture of assurance. And then here we have uh, Buddha in uh, Vitaka Mudra, that means teaching. So he is again seated on the lotus, you know, with upward and downward petals, and you have a monk in veneration, and then you have another uh, woman venerating, and then we have putis, that means uh, cupids, venerating him. It's a beautiful statue, and then others, prime images uh, uh, with the garlands. What is really interesting for art historians and buddhologists is what is happening in the third register. Here you have two elephants on either side, and fortunately we can see one, this one is broken with a putti, and then uh, there are two women with garlands for the, uh, for the buddhas and bodhisattvas. If you count, you have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, seven Buddhas. It's not the same Gautama Buddha, these are the Buddhas of the past, that means what we call the Manushya Buddhas. Um, and they were, they were before Gautama Buddha, like Kashyapa, Kanakamuni, Konagama, Vipassin, Vesuba and others. So here we have the, the last Buddha, who is called Gautama or Siddhartha. Interesting thing is, here we have Maitreya. Maitreya is a Bodhisattva, he is the Buddha to come. So we identify him because he has in his hand a water pot, which is a symbol of the Brahminical caste. So he is dressed like a prince. So it shows the succession. You have first Buddha Gautama as Bodhisattva, and then the enlightened one, and then the Buddha to be. So it's a, it's a wonderful um, way of showing to, to, uh, to people that the, the Buddhism continue and there will be another Buddha who would come, uh, uh, come take in the place of Buddha Gautama. After that, and it has different schools of art. If you start with this here, this is a little bit of out of Gandhara, but it's in Afghanistan, but it was in India those days. This is what we call the Kapisa style. He's, uh, he's little bit, you know, as if uh, smashed. He's not very, so, uh, very tall. Um, uh, so this is the style. If you compare with the other Buddhas, they are, I mean, proportionately they are correct. And here we have, a, I mean, he's holding his chivara or the overload. And with this hand, he should be making the Abhya Mutra. The hand is broken. Uh, and then you have two, uh, two gods venerating him, maybe Brahma and Indra, unfortunately, the he is gone. I was explaining the meaning of this uh, sculpture, which is, uh, which should be the biggest, I think, Julia, in the exhibition. Um, when Bodhisattva was enlightened, um, so the, and his father asked him to come back to the, his town, which is called Kapila Vastu, and the Brahmins didn't want to believe that the son of Suddhodana was enlightened, he has achieved the Buddhahood. And uh, so Buddha, uh, Buddha, I mean there are many occasions, but I, again a long story short, to convince the, uh, the Shakyas, the people of Shak, I mean his kingdom, that he has attained the Buddhahood, he was deviating with the water coming from the feet and the fire from the shoulders. Mm. And after that, he changed it. Fire, uh, the water came from the shoulders, fire came from the feet. And after that, he multiplied himself. 
So in different poses, one is uh, seated, the then of course deviating, seated, walking and reclining. So this is one moment, one of the miracles of the Buddha, that we are very fortunate to have it. There are very few sculptures of this type. There, are, there is one in Kabul Museum, one in Calcutta, they were all found in Afghanistan. And uh, uh, this is the fifth statue we know of this time. And then we the profile of the statue is absolutely beautiful. I mean, compared to the other one, uh, this is a high school, high school in the sense uh, from Peshawar, Taktibai, and Saribalo, which is the heart of the Gandhara. You can see, I mean, of course, the, the father of uh, Buddhist art, the French. Um, uh, uh, French archaeologist and art historian called Alfred Fouché said he called it Greco Buddhist. So, Greco Buddhist art. So, his hypothesis was since nobody knew how Buddha looked like, but these sculptures were done at least 700 after the birth of the Buddha. So, they took the most beautiful Greek god Apollo and converted him into this, uh, I mean, the, uh, uh, to Buddha. So, you can see the features are wonderful. And he is seated in meditation with the Bodhidhani. And then you can see the feet. You can see the traces of the feet here. And then, uh, since he is a great noble being, uh, he was not like us. He had 32 exceptions. All the 32 exceptions are not shown on, normally on the sculptures, but at least two, which is the Urna, which is a lock of hair in the mid, uh, middle of the forehead and then the Ushnisha, which is a perseverance of the skull. So all other, other exceptions are not, I mean, for, for example, the hand should, uh, both hands should come to the knee, and they are, they are, should be like this, and they are webbed. Uh, sometimes you get the webbed fingers, not everywhere, but uh, it shows a little bit of the Buddha. He has a halo, I mean, uh, which may have inspired later the Christianity for the saints to have this. And then here you have uh, uh, some sort of a jutting out element. This is to fix in an umbrella, what you call the chatra or a parasol. So there are two statues of this side, this one and this one. And then if you come closer, if you do the same thing which I did, if you look at the profile, so immediately get an idea of it. So this is the different school. It's, it's a provincial style. It can't be Peshawar, which is not the same hand, and the, the proportions are different. Um, Urna is not very well pronounced, even the Vishnesha. What is interesting is the hello and, the, and this part of the, uh, of, of the statue. So you can see this one, and then there is a very beautiful statue here. Um, you can see the hand, he's holding the overlock, and then the hand. And you see the hand is diaphanous, transparent under the um, uh, under the robe. So I told you about Maitreya robe. Uh, he has beautiful silken clothes wearing. We normally he should hold a water pot, kundika, but this part is broken unfortunately. But with the hair knot, which is a grammatical knot, so we we believe he is Maitreya. But look at the details, the treatment of the hair, all the beads, and then the, uh, the earrings, the torque, uh, the tight necklace, and the long necklace with, you know, uh, multiple chains. And then here you have two monsters fighting for a chain in the middle, right? And then you have, since he's a Brahminical caste, he has got the sacred thread, what you call the Upavita. So you have the Upavita here. And then you have the uh, arm, uh, um, arm bands that you can see since the rope is over it you can see it, I mean uh, below the below the rope or below the shaft you can see that too so it's a wonderful um, uh, wonderful sculpture it's completely different from the Buddha because he's still the prince to Buddha to be dimensions when I saw it for the first time it came like oh this is really a one so here the Buddha is different from the ones that we have seen. He has jewelry, he has wonderful robe with the V-shaped collar, and then he's seated in a bench, what we call the European style, human at ease, instead of doing the 
the, what we call the Padmasana, like a, like a flower, and also is very well dressed. And so this is the continuity of the Gandhara Nath. Um, so we know meditate that we have given the date to 7th, 8th century. It could be from the North uh, Afghanistan or from Kashmir. This is what we call the Kashmir style. Um, and it's perfectly I mean, found in this condition with beautiful uh, mandrola and also the halo which is decorated with flower motifs. Um, so that's the, that's the uh, towards the end of the uh, Buddhism in India. So, and here, the, in the, like there were Manushya Buddhas or Buddhas in human form before the Gautama Buddha, there are other Bodhisattvas to come. So this is the beginning of Mahayana. Uh, you know, we have a Theravada, that means the school of the ancient, old, and then the Mahayana, the great vehicle, and the most important Bodhisattva is Padmapani Aurobhiteshwara, who became extremely popular in India, in Sri Lanka, Southeast Asia, China, Japan, Korea, under the name of Arugateshwar and Guanyin, as you know. Um, he was famous because he was considered as a healer for the, uh, I mean, for, for all types of diseases, and also he was a protector of the mariners. So traders loved him to have a statue of him in their ships or when they walk, and to identify from, uh, from uh, 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 from Maitreya, he has in the Jata, Jata means the headdress, uh, a statue, small seated statue, you can see if you come closer, of Amitabha, his spiritual father. So he's seated, since he's Padma, Padma, being the, Padma means the lotus, so he's holding the lotus in the hand. Okay? This is what we call the four encounters. So this is uh, again a masterpiece that I saw for the first time um, uh, and exhibited here. So here you can see the Bodhisattva on the horseback quitting the gate of the uh, palace. So you can see uh, the figure is beautiful if you come closer, the way the horse harnessing I don't have time to go into details. This is one of the most beautiful hosannas in this we, we can see in India, right? So it's absolutely wonderful. So here you have a god holding a chatra and a parasol. Uh, what does he see? He sees two people. One is sick, right? That is a sick man with a huge belly. So he must be suffering from something. And then he saw an old man with a stick. And the third one was a dead man, and the fourth one was a, a, a mendicant wearing a saffron color robe. So the young prince got upset seeing these four encounters and asked him, I mean, the gods explained, this is what happens to all of us. We, we don't remain ever young, so we, we get old and we get sick and we die. And so he got frustrated with the life. And the second scene shows um, uh, what happened after. So, uh, uh, Bodhisattva was born, uh, born in, uh, uh, in the kingdom of Kapilavastu Magadha. His father was Sudhodhana and he has uh, the mother uh, Mahamaya. Uh, so he came from the Tushita heaven in the form of a uh, a form of, a, of an elephant and entered, I mean, of course, mother dreamt not that the elephant, uh, elephant uh, entered uh, into the womb and he was born there. Uh, one week after the birth of the Bodhisattva, his mother passed away uh, and went to the paradise, the Tusita heaven, and became a god, not a goddess, but a god. So he had a wonderful life, look after by the sister of his mother, Mahapadapati. And uh, when, uh, when he was taken uh, to, the, uh, to the capital city, um, uh, the, one of the sages said, if he remains in the palace, he will become a universal king, a Chakravarti, or he will become an ascetic. So father wanted him to be a 
wonderful universal king, a conqueror. So he made three palaces and he had a lot of luxury life and got the most beautiful uh, woman in the kingdom. So one day, uh, so with all that pleasures, I mean, he had everything, music, dance, women, and everything. One day when he was, we left uh, the palace to go to the garden, something really struck him. So he, what he did was he asked all the palace women to dance day and night to, to, I mean, to, I mean, for his pleasure. So they, they he decided, so here you have his beautiful wife, Yashodara. He is seated on a bed, which is like a Greek bed. And then he saw these women, I mean, I'm, I'm not what I'm saying, but the sacred text said, the, the women appeared to him as if it was a cemetery. They were snoring, rambling, laughing, and all the things. So he decided to leave the palace, and he asked the groom, Chandaka, to bring his headdress. So he got, I mean, uh, then he, of course, um, uh, took it, and then he left the palace. Right? So the story is. Look at the beauty of this sculpture. So this is a drum. You know, the, the stupas are circular. You can see the curves shape of it. And um, these are the uh, acanthus leaves that you can see. And you can see the holes here. This is to fix another series of sculptures. Um, um, this is the moment that he decides to leave the palace, leaving his wife, who is, uh, you know, um, uh, lying on the couch, right, you can see her face, and asking Channa, uh, his I mean, servant, to bring the, uh, bring the horse, which is called Kantaka. And you can see the women, I mean, they are now completely tired and they are sleeping, even one is sleeping while standing, uh, and he's making the sign come. And then he, he was on the, on Kantaka, right, uh, was riding the horse, um, but the gods were very, uh, very concerned about this. If the father comes to know that he has left the palace, I mean, he will send the soldiers because the whole city was guarded by thousands and thousands of soldiers. So the, what the god did was that they carry the horse. If the horse I mean, walks, then you get the sound, right? So they carry the horse and sometimes in politics he was flying with, with the horse and in the Gandharan Sanskrit sense the gods were carrying the horse with celestial bodyguards. So you can see and also you can see a soldier again, the Greek-like soldier with the metaphractus. So wow. this is a wonderful scene of that. lived in the forest uh, for six years. So he was asking all the Brahminical teachers how to avoid the old age, sickness, and the death. So they gave him a lot of advice and the, the sacred text, these uh, sages were sitting on their nails, so they were eating, uh, um, they were hardly eating anything, so they were doing a lot of uh, all kinds of sacrifices. So Buddha decided to, to, to find a way to get rid of or to get rid of the death, uh, old age and sickness. So he started what we call the self-mortification. For six years he, done, he did not eat or hardly ate anything. So he became like a skeleton. So, so the gods and his mother who is now a god got very upset thinking that he will die like this without becoming the enlightenment. So, so they intervened. After six years, he decided to give up, um, uh, give up fasting. So uh, uh, a village girl called Sujata of high birth uh, came with the first meal after six years. Mm -hmm. So after that, he of course went under the tree of Bodhi, the Paikis religiosa, and attained the enlightenment, mm -hmm. right? So this is the, the continuity of the story. Um, when he got in 
So um, he's seated under the tree, which is called Bodhi, or the Vikas Pali Gyoza, and he started meditating, but he had an enemy, like in the Christian Swami Lucifer and others, for Jesus Christ, his enemy was called Mara. So Mara wanted to stop him. So he made uh, many attempts. Uh, at it also, I mean, to, to give you a you know, I mean, uh, small idea, in Pali, uh, Pali context, it was a psychological fight that he was fighting against himself. But in the Gandhara, because these were the region where the Greeks were there, it was a physical, physical fight. So Buddha, you have to imagine Buddha seated here, meditating, and his demoniac army throwing weapons and trying to kill him. But the paper stopped. There was some sort of a, a, a prabhamandala, which is a circle. Uh, so he was there. He didn't, he didn't care about those. But you can see, they took ugly faces. Look at this few. Come closer after. You can see three faces here. And he's like he's a demoniac. He has got all types of um, um, uh, weapons. And you can see the others carrying different types of weapons, attacking the Buddha. And look at this person here. He's almost dressed like a Greek soldier. So this is the important thing about the Scythians. The, the coin I showed you, uh, what we call the cataphractor, so the heavy armor, because everything was heavy, scale armor, and he's wearing. So it's quite interesting for the Gandharan artist uh, of, of these convert, converted Indian Buddhists, the enemies was their enemy. The Buddha's enemy was their enemy with um, the Scythians and the Greeks. Same thing happened, you know, the story in Sri Lanka, we were there with Julia and Sri Lanka. And in Sri Lankan paintings, where you have the Maras attack, you have British soldiers holding guns. <laughs> <laughs> so, as you know, there were no guns during the time of Buddha's speech. So it's, it's quite interesting how the, the, they created the atmosphere of this war. So later you can come and have a look. And here you have Mara, he's armed, you can see here. He has got the, what we call Akinekes, which is a, a, a dragon, right? A dragon here. And he is comforted by one of his sons, I mean, the demoniac army. So we can't, we can't kill him, we can't, uh, we can't defeat him. So Buddha was enlightened. So just to, then I should. seated in the middle and they have got these uh, arms and here uh, so Buddha was enlightened he became the Buddha and he decided to stay for 49 days seven weeks he was so happy uh, in the vicinity of the Bodhi tree and after that two merchants coming from Orissa called Trapashu and Balluko Tapasu Balluko in Bali they offered him the first meal after 49 days of starvation. And then here we have the first servant. Before that, we will go to this. He offered him a, a meal, which was honey and some sort of rice porridge. Uh, so Buddha was very happy to Now I call him Buddha because he's no more Bodhisattva, he's the enlightened one. Uh, but Buddha didn't have a bowl to put his uh, uh, food. So the Lokapalas, Lokapalas are the, the goals of four directions, north, south, west, east. They saw that Buddha didn't have a bowl, so they first came with gold bowls, bowls made of gold. Buddha said, for an ascetic, I don't need gold. So, I mean, the story continues and they offered silver, they offered uh, lapis lazuli, they offered crystal. Buddha refused all of them. So at the end, they came with four stone bowls. So Buddha took one by one, so you can see he offered his balls, he is holding it. There are other sculptures. He took the other three and put it one over the other, so the four balls became one. So he put his uh, first meal there and then uh, he could eat it. So you can see how it is pictured. So you have the world of the uh, human beings here, you know, which is Buddha now. And then the, you have the world of the gods. Um, uh, uh, on, uh, on the other side. And this is very interesting. Um, Indian looking Vajrapani. Vajrapani is again another characteristic of, uh, um, uh, of the Gandharan art. 
Heracles became Indian god and he became the bodyguard or the protector of the Buddha holding the thunderbolt. Normally Heracles should have a club in the hand, right? But here, instead of the club, he has got the thunderbolt. So he, Buddha was very happy. He had the first meal after 49 days. Uh, I achieved the Buddhahood. Am I going to preach this to normal human beings? He said it was so difficult for him to achieve uh, this knowledge of enlightenment. He said ordinary people who are interested um, with their day-to-day -day life, luxury life and desires and everything, they won't understand the, uh, my, my, uh, my teaching, my achievement. So he said, I'm not going to teach. Then the gods got upset and they came in thousands and asked Buddha several times, please change your mind. So this is the moment the gods came. You have Brahma, the creator, Indra, the supreme god, and other gods. They are coming with flowers and discussing with Buddha. So at the end he said, yes, I'm going to teach. So he accepted to teach. And then, of course, his first uh, disciples, five of them, were his former, when he was looking for the truth in the forest, those ascetics, mendicants, and they became the first. And then it spread all over India. So during this period, he performed different types of miracles. And I'll just show you one. Uh, I won't explain others, but if you want, um, I will do that just to give you an idea. He had a cousin, the, the maternal uncle, uncle's son called Devadatta. He was very jealous of the Buddha because um, the, when he was the Bodhisattva, he married the woman that he wanted. So he wanted to take the revenge from him. So what he did was, he gave palm, uh, palm juice, what you call toddy, so it's alcohol, to the, to the elephant, and the elephant became wild. And the elephant was sent to the street where Buddha was coming. The wild, I mean, the elephant started killing people, right? And at the moment when Buddha approached, a woman was carrying a child. The child fell on the ground. Buddha stopped the elephant and saved the child. And after that, um, the elephant was saved. And here it's very interesting, the figure on, the, on our right hand side, on the Buddha's left hand side, is the Indian version of Greek Heracles. And then on the below, you have another scene, Buddha in Abhya Mudra, preaching to the monks, which, uh, who are on the left hand side. And then you have an ascetic, old ascetic, followed by a young one, holding a fruit. So normally, as I said, there is this controversy in Buddhism, Buddha was from the caste of the Kshatriyas, that in the governing caste, and the ascetics are Brahm, Brahmins, high caste. So Brahmin wanted to hear Buddha's teaching, so he had a fruit. So Buddha said, you have a seed, and you can develop this seed. So he started preaching. Um, so I think with this I will stop. There are other things that I... Did.